but all these people count on me as a leader. And so if, if I didn't show up, why would they want to show up? Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 624, with my guest today, Andy Rodriguez. Who am I? Well, I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm just a guy who loves martial arts and said, hey, I want that to be my job. So I made it my job. And this show is part of that job. If you want to see all the things that we've got going at Whistlekick, you can go to, drumroll please, whistlekick.com, because I don't name things in any kind of funky, creative way. We make it easy. Whistlekick.com is where you're going to find out all the projects and the products that we've got going on to enhance your martial arts experience. Because we love traditional martial arts and we're going to give you all the stuff we can to help you get as much out of your martial arts lifestyle as possible. One of the things that you'll find at Whistlekick.com is our store. It's one of the ways that we pay the bills. And if you use the code PODCAST15, P-O-D-C-A-S-T-1-5, you're going to save 15% on maybe some gear or a uniform, or a shirt, or a hat, or any one of the other many, many things that we've got over there. Now, if you want to dig deeper on this show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Remember when I said I don't name things in any kind of creative way? Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place you're going to find everything related to this show, whether it's transcripts or videos, photos, social media and web links, all kinds of good stuff over there for this and every single episode we have ever done. The show comes out twice a week. We bring you two episodes for free. And the whole goal is to connect and educate and entertain you, the traditional martial artists of the world. Now, if all this stuff that we do, if it means something to you, if if you get value out of it and you want to support us, well, first off, you listening and saying nice things, that's the number one thing I can ask for. But if you're willing to do a little bit more, yeah, you could buy some. You could also check out our training programs at whistlekickprograms.com. If you want to get faster, if you want the only training protocol for becoming a faster martial artist, you will find it over there for, I guarantee, less than you think it would be. If you want to grab one of our books at Amazon, go to Amazon.com and search for Whistlekick, and you're going to find all kinds of stuff over there. But we've also got a Patreon account, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. It's a place where we post exclusive content, and if you contribute as little as two bucks a month, you're going to get access. We've got a few tiers over there. The more you throw, the more we're going to give you. We give you exclusive behind the scenes, audio, video, all kinds of stuff that you aren't going to find anywhere else. And you also get bonus exclusive merch that depending on the tier you're in, we just kind of throw you automatically. We included that recently. We didn't raise the prices because we're all about value. My conversation today with Andy Rodriguez was, well, it was, it was fun. I just had a lot of fun talking with him. We talked about all the stuff that you would think. We talked about training. We talked about his school and teaching and how he got started and his views on, I don't know, a dozen different things. But what I think I I found most enjoyable about this one is that because we agreed on a lot of things and he was so willing to be open, I would take a stab and say, well, how about this thing? And he would say, yeah, and. It was almost that if, if you know anything about improv, it's all yes, and. And he, yes, and all over the place. And it was great. And we had a wonderful time. I had a wonderful time. I think he did too. And I think you're going to have a wonderful time listening. So here it goes. Hey, Andy, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's it's great to have you here. Thank you. You know, um, you know l- listeners, I, I, as I'm sure you all know, in almost every episode we have kind of some some pre-show chat you know, and it sets the tone. And and I don't usually share what I just shared with with you, Andy, uh, with most of the guests, because it, it almost, it gets almost a little morose when I think about it that way, you know, but it, it, it seems like you get it. So I, I, I'm looking forward to a good episode, a nice open episode, good conversation, good stuff. So thanks for, thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we've got to start somewhere. Okay. And, and I've got half a dozen questions kind of at the ready that I could ask you that would help us start. And lately, I've been trying to introduce some some different ones just at, just for the sake of variety. So I'm going I'm to throw one at you that I've never asked as an opening question before, but let's give it a whirl. What was your last training session like? Um, last training session last was last night, um, and it was therapeutic. How about that? 
I had a great long weekend this past weekend with my youngest daughter's high school graduation. And so we actually use uh, my home dojo sometimes for family parties. And, and uh, so it was a busy weekend and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, we just, you know, had a, such a great time celebrating our daughter's graduation. And I could not, um, after that, after that was done, could not wait to get the dojo back up and ready and uh, train the very next day. Uh, it was, it was uh, uh, almost like a release after a very, very exciting yet stressful weekend. But, uh, you know, that's what it, you know, the, the dojo is for, is, is for me personally to kind of re-energize and reset. That's awesome. You, you have a home dojo. Is it, how, how much have you put into that? People sometimes go kind of crazy with their home dojo. Um, I like to keep it simple. Um, okay. My home dojo um, has, um, I'm on my 19th year uh, teaching and training at oh, my wow. home dojo. And uh, so next year will be uh, our 20th anniversary. And I love it. I love it. I love that, uh, you know, um, it's, it, it truly feels like a family environment. A lot of the mm. people that have trained with me for many years, I've um, grown to, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, view them like an extended, truly an extended family um, through blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and there's just uh, a lot of pluses to having, for me personally, of home dojo. That's, it, it, it's what works for me. Mm. Um, especially during the pandemic, uh, you know, during the pandemic, um, I felt really, really bad for many of the commercial dojos, yeah. uh, out there. And I, you know, I want to also, please forgive me. I want a big, big shout out to my parent organization, Sabuda Kai down in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Chinto Khan, um, uh, the, uh, the founder, Master Masaharu Sakin Kai is the individual that really, um, sparked my fire for, training um back in 1984 amazing individual um his son and his mother is uh, running the organization right now so shion sakamakai and uh dojo cho sakamakai they're doing an amazing job so big shout out to them down in jacksonville florida and uh, for all their support um but you know during the pandemic it, i felt really um you know it was uh, a very difficult time and i actually work in healthcare, so it hit, hit me personally hard on a professional level besides um, on the dojo level. Um, of course, we could not train for a couple months. Um, I had to deal with you know, a lot of crises at the long-term care facility that I work at uh, for the first couple months when we had um, an outbreak. So it was very challenging. I had to put a pause on regular teaching and training for a couple months. It was really the first time that I had to do that in 18, 19 years. Mm. Um, so it was very, very difficult. Um, but we started a, a phasing in approach with my dojo after things started to kind of um, slow down a little bit as far as the pandemic and nearing the spring and summer, you know, phased in with outside training. Um, and because, you know, we have such a small dojo of, as far as membership, um, it's a lot easier to kind of keep track of the individuals as far as contact tracing and sure. screening and things like that. So we were pretty much up and running to normal training by June or July, mm. which was great. So. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, I give uh, all uh, respect to all those individuals who, who are able to have a commercial dojo um, and keep things going. It's very, very challenging. Um, I know. Um, but uh, uh, all those individuals out there, you do good work. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it has not been an easy time for martial arts schools. But one of the things that's, that we've seen kind of uh, as we were coming out of everything is that there's a lot of pent up demand and it's sad that a lot of schools have had to close, but the ones that have managed to survive are attracting students at a rate that many of them have never seen before. And I, I'm hopeful that this will lead into, you know, I don't know if I want to go so far as to say, you know, another golden age of martial arts enrollment, but maybe at least an uptick. I think so. I think that once, you know, we had the pandemic, I think the initial thought was, Oh, well, it's okay. We can do it online. But I think after a few months, people were really, really, um, you know, they were really hungry to connect with others and train with others hand it, you know, it, you know, at, on a personal level in a dojo setting, in a gym setting, and um, they missed the value in that. I mean, you hear old stories of masters, you know, famous masters, they go in solitude to the mountains 
and they they figure out a secret technique and they bring it down. They call it, this is my new Wuha. You know, this is what I discovered. And I've been in the mountains in solitude for, for many, many years. And I came down to, to share this with you. Um, I felt like that the pandemic was almost like uh, the world make, and making everyone go to the mountain, <laughs> to solitude, you know, and it was, it was very interesting for me personally as a martial artist for, you know, since the eighties that, um, I really value training in solitude, but I so value training with others. Oh my gosh. It just gave me like, wow. I just, I, I just missed it so much. Mm, yeah. I, I'm right there with you. I, I, and, and I know we're not alone in that, you know, he, here's a, here's a question, you know, okay. one of, one of my kind of core philosophies in life is that any negative, if you look at it creatively enough there's a positive there. And maybe it's just a lesson, but I, I think oftentimes professionally, you know, whether it's, it's a business or our job or whatever, if we take a, a negative situation, there's a way that we can turn it into an asset, you know, liability can be flipped. Absolutely. Was there anything like that for you as you went through the process of, you know, pulling back and then stepping back in over the last 18 months or so? Um, what was interesting was that, um, when the the outbreak that happened at the long term care facility that I, I work in, and I've been there, um, this will be my 25th year. Uh, I work on a regional level and, and human resources, but many of the individuals that work at this facility, I hired them. And I always felt like all the years I've been practicing martial arts that, um, you know, I, I feel confident that I could take care of myself and, and, and take care of my loved ones. But when the outbreak, you know, really happened in that facility and in my facility was the first outbreak in our state was our, at our location. Our location was grand zero. And, and I remember coming home that first day and after we, we had lost so many people, so many patients that, uh, in, in, a, in, in less than a week, close to 11, uh, residents. And I felt helpless. Like, and I thought to myself, you know, what did it, all that training, I mean, I can't block the virus. I can't punch it. Um, what do I do? So, you know, there was a lot of thoughts that came to mind. And I, I remember that uh, our, our founder of our association he said that uh, training physically is, is very, very important, but you have to really train mentally as well. And at that point of despair, I, that kind of rung true, like, wow. I am really lacking on my mental training, on my spiritual training. Um, and, you know, it, and he's not the first to say that. And I think Chetiko Kian had, had mentioned, uh, Kian Sensei, uh, you know, one of the main masters at Okinawa for Shurenru, you know, ha however well you train, um, and however, you know, physically uh, strong you are, if you are mentally not clear-sighted and stable, you're not going to be able to use your art. Uh, for self-defense. And that moment of despair at that time um, was a, a was a time for me to kind of like, okay, all right. And I, I actually, you know, was to the point of tears. What do I do? I don't, I didn't really have to go into the facility. I did not really have to go into the facility because I could work from home. But all these people counted on me as a leader. And so if if I didn't show up, why would they want to show up? And so at that point, I, I felt weak that my training wasn't strong enough. And then in the end, I did go in the very next day um, and just, you know, try to be supportive, help all the you know departments as well as I could, uh, even though I was afraid, uh, deeply afraid. And I think that maybe the training did help me a little bit. It, it, it did make me realize that I still have a long way to go and it's never ending. But, uh, um, you know, that, that to me was kind of an eye opener, um, that, you know, all the training that we physically do, um, you know, the, it really, um, the true foundation is your mental training that's required. Mm. The true foundation is mental training. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's a subject that I think a lot of people get. I think they either completely agree 
or don't. I, I don't have a lot of experience with people who find gray area there. Now, personally, I, I think the mental side, the personal growth, the self-development, whatever you want to call it, of training, mm. I think that's the, that's the key. I think that's the, the true value. Yes. And if you want to get stronger, martial arts isn't the best way. If you want to get faster, if you want to get more flexible, martial arts is not the best way. Right. But I think if you want to become the best version of yourself, I think martial arts is the best way. That's right. That's Where right. Where was it in your training that, because I, when we start, I, I don't know any white belt to walk in day one and they're like, you know, I'm really excited to become a better person, right? Like <laughs> we, we all start with, with punches and kicks and stances and, and, and whatnot, uh, or, or, you know, shrimping and I'm thinking of equivalents. In, in, in yeah, the absolutely. World, right. Where was it in your journey that you started to pay more attention to this other aspect or here we are in hindsight, this bigger piece of the training, the mental side? Well, uh, you know, my sensei, you frequently would do mozo or um, meditation. Um, but uh, early on in the late 80s, when I was moving up the ranks, he generally would have the senior ranks, usually it was brown belt and above, assist a little bit with teaching the other Q ranks, the lower ranks. And um, I didn't really, really appreciate, I didn't really understand why um, I was asked to do so. I, I just did it. Um, and then as years passed, when I opened up my home dojo, I started to understand over time the value of teaching because you meet a lot of different types of people. Um, when you teach children, you learn a lot of patience um, and you make a lot of mistakes, you know, and uh, hopefully um, you learn from them. So I think that, her, you know, for my personal journey, um, actually teaching the art actually moved me further uh, uh, ahead uh, on my journey of personal growth. Um, that to me was, uh, as I reflect back, um, what's, what really helped me personally. When you think about that approach, uh, let's call it a, a tool in your toolkit, mm. are there any times in your life that stick out where you were thankful that you had that available to you? Any difficult times, challenges that you said, ah, I'm really thankful for my martial training and, and, and that it gave me this because it made it easier for me to work through or around over whatever you choose. Yeah, I, for me personally, I think the, you know, the, the teaching all those years um, actually really put me on uh, to appreciate um, being, uh, being humble. Mm. Um, you know, I've been at uh, different, uh, you know, seminars, what have you, and then you have certain situ uh, individuals that, you know, they have a, a very, very, um, they're very, very confident. And sometimes that comp confidence comes across uh, a little bit over the top. Um, and, you know, and I was probably there at one time and over, over the years, I realized, Oh, that was me and my ego. I need to feed my ego. I, I, I have some insecurities myself and, and that, that training and working with others, no matter if they were my senior or they just started walk, you know, they walked into class for the very first day. Um, and when they ask questions and, and maybe even challenge why we dirt do certain things and instead of being defensive and saying, just do it, what have you, that actually spilled over for me in the workplace where um, I learned to work with all different types of people. Um, and uh, as far as, work, you know, working in management, that was extremely, extremely helpful and also extremely helpful in my family life as well, you know, so. They all, I think, help each other. You know, being a family man helps me be a, a better teacher. You know, being a karate teacher and practitioner helps me to be a, a better family man and vice versa. They kind of feed each other. Well, as long as I, I know where to recognize where that negative side is that I need to work on to approve upon. Mm. I'm with you. Yeah. All right. Now, if we... I don't, I don't think we, we, we got there. Pardon me if I'm, if I'm misremembering. This is one of the challenges okay. of recording multiple interviews in a day. I try really hard to empty my cup, my brain yep. in between. It doesn't always work. Um, 
I, I think I heard you say you started training in 85? I started in 84. 84, okay. But I don't recall hearing the why. Ah, yeah. Did we did we talk about the why? Yeah, Andrew told me that you would ask the why. Yeah, this is this is like <laughs> my favorite. It, it, the my two favorite things about people to to learn are why did they start training and why are they still training? Right, right. So let's let's tackle both of those. Let's start with the the then why why did you start? And actually, I started in 1980. I started American Kempo, and okay. uh, uh, I trained there a couple of years. Uh, I was an adolescent at that time. Um, and, you know, I, I look, looking back, I really thank my parents for paying the tuition because they really did not have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. They were, they were raising six kids. My dad always worked two jobs. Um, and then there was at some point where I had to stop training because they just could not afford it. And then I, you know, over a year or two, I heard about this amazing teacher, Master Master Haru Sakamakai in Delaware. So. Uh, I started, you know, working very young, saving my money. <laughs> and as soon as I got my license and was able to buy a car, I signed up and I could not wait in 1984. So um, that's when I started. And the reason why I started, um, I would say, I, you know, there are many reasons people start training. And I would say for many people, uh, when I look back, it was fear. Um, I lived in a neighborhood where we were probably the only, uh, I'm Puerto Rican descent. And so when my parents moved to the suburbs, when I was one, uh, one year, you know, at one years old, um, we were the only Hispanics that lived in a certain neighborhood. So growing up, I had, um, there were a lot of white kids in the neighborhood and I looked different. Um, when they asked me where I was from, I was different. And so with that, I was bullied a lot. And, um, what I didn't know years later is that these same people that became my friends over the years, they, they viewed me as a, as, as a bully too. You know, they, mm. they, they said that I was the tough kid on the block and I actually was able to somewhat take care of myself in the neighborhood. But, uh, I wasn't, I was constantly, I think deep down inside looking back, I, I probably would not have said that years ago. Um, but now I realize that it was based in fear and that's why I started training. Mm. Um, and I started taking American Kempo and it was a great, it was great a couple of years. It just, something just didn't feel right. And they used to tell me, you know what, your kata is awesome, but you look different for some reason. You're, you're, the way you move is different. I don't know what it is. Um, and I did well in tournaments. And um, then I found the uh, Chintakan organization, Sabudukai, uh, which is, it's, uh, it's now named uh, the Chintakan organization run by Master Sakamakai. And I remember training there and he's like, hey, have you, have you practiced? And he, he spoke very, very broken English. Have you practiced Okinawan Karate before? I said, no. He said, because you look like you practiced before. So my movement was kind of natural hmm. to the kata. Um, and, I, and to me, when I started training, I felt, I felt at home. Like, hey, I've been here before. <laughs> you know, it felt right. And back then, we had, he had two-hour training sessions, which was awesome. Wow. And they were, they were intense. Um, I remember walking out of the dojo and my gi was just totally drenched <laughs> almost every night. I remember having so many pains in my legs and my arms, but it felt right. It felt good. And then over time, you know, you start moving up in rank um, and you start going to tournaments. And I did very well in the tournament scene. Of course, you know, the kata regional and national tournaments, I, you know, um, won, won um, high awards um, nationally as well. Um, and that was attractive because you start, people start noticing you, you start getting a little, um, you know, you know, your name's in the paper. It's like, wow, my name's in the paper. And at that time I didn't realize it, but I started losing the, the reason why I started training or I want to say start training because the fear was not an issue anymore. Why I continue to train and why I continue to train now. Um, and what I learned over a few years is that I just enjoy it. I just enjoy it. Um, Karate by uh, Jesse Ankam just did a, it wasn't not Jesse Ankam, it was another gentleman that he interviewed, I forget the young um, Japanese sensei uh, uh, in Japan, a Shotokan sensei, but he interviewed a, a few Okinawan senseis that, that were there, they were in their 70s. And I think a couple of them said pretty much the same thing. 
he asked them, why do you still train into your 70s or 80s? And they simply said, I just enjoy it. I just enjoy training. And one sense they said, well, have you ever, what would you, uh, what would you say if you just one day just stop brushing your teeth? And the sensei was like, well, I, I, I need to brush my teeth. He said, well, I need to train. That's how I treat my training. It's like it's something that's part of my living. And that's how I kind of view um, my training and, and uh, um, today. Um, it brings me joy. I see it how, how it's helped me over the years grow as an individual. Uh, it, it doesn't always work for that for everyone, though. I think uh, you have to allow to tr the training to the develop the, the person. The person has to allow it. Some people train for, for many, many, many years, and they're um, constantly just primarily focused on the physical aspect of the technique and uh, the strength and the speed, uh, but they lose the, um, the awareness of what it can do to a person as far as their, as far as their spiritual development. I don't, and I don't even want to say spiritual, um, more of their personal development as a human being. Mm. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. And, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, I, I, I've got a theory when, back when you were doing Kempo and you didn't move like them, but then you, you started in this new organization and you moved a little more like them. Did your family do a lot of dancing in the home? Did you uh, do dancing? <laughs> Jerry, that's awesome. Um, yeah, my dad was yeah. a pretty awesome dancer. Um, you know, the Hispanic dances from uh, uh, from Puerto Rico. He was he was always cutting the rug at parties and at weddings. I I, I had a feeling. So uh, one <laughs> one of the things that I can say as someone who was trained in a whole bunch of different schools, Kempo, Japanese, Okinawan. I mean, I've been all over the map. Is that in the Okinawan kata, I find there's a rhythm to them. Yes. Even if you are not taught that rhythm, if you spend enough time doing those forms, you're going to find that rhythm. And I'm guessing that that's what you had going in because that's what your body knew. That's where your proprioceptive awareness was, was headed was towards some kind of rhythm that I, I, I won't say it's absent in Kempo forms, but I have not seen it in the Kempo that I've trained in. Mm. Now That's you think guess. it's the, you think it's the rhythm of the kata of the rhythm of the individual doing the kata. It could be a combination of both. It, it, it could be. I think you were putting in a rhythm. I'm guessing you were putting in a rhythm that they weren't used to seeing yes. among kempo practitioners. Yes, that that's, looked that's funny. Probably, yes, but in in a different context, it was expected and even uh, appreciated. So you're you're basically saying I was doing the cha cha. <laughs> Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes, you you were you were doing. <laughs> it, it, it can be kind of like the uh, um, the cha cha kata. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to come up with a hybridization of the, of those words, and I don't have anything anything more fun than that. So let's go with it. Yeah, the cha cha kata, ka cha cha. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for going there with me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So we're we're. <sighs> At what point did your training become like that brushing of the teeth? It sounded like you really identified with that statement. So I'm guessing you feel that way about your training. When Was there a point when you said, you know, I, I can't stop doing this? Yeah, I think, yes, that's a good question, too. Um, so I got married in 1995 and uh, uh, been married 25 years last year. My lovely wife. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and first few years of marriage was awesome, but the first two to three years, I mean, I, I stopped training, um, uh, at the Jinta organization in about 94, I got married in 95 for personal reasons. But, um, the first couple years of marriage, you know, I was off and my wife, when, when we dated, she knew I was heavy into martial arts. Um, and the first few years when we we were married, she's like, what's wrong? There's something not right. And I, I just don't know. I can't put my finger on it. And I just didn't think I uh, would miss it. Didn't even think about it. But then I realized, you know what? I'm mentally off my game because I'm not doing what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about my wife, of course, but you have to have something else. 
And so that's at that point where I realized I started training again and then things started to come and uh, normalize. And it was almost like bringing balance within, within me again. Like this, this was part of me. This, this is something that is as equal to my right arm. If my arm, right arm is missing. It's, I'm going to miss it. <laughs> so when I started training, I, I felt a, a sense of, you know, again, balance and peace. And that's when I came to the realization that this is something I just really cannot stop. Hmm. This is part of me. I understand. And I suspect many, many, if not most or darn close to all of the people listening can relate to what you're saying. You know, people, we, we don't have a whole lot of casual martial artists listening to the show. They listen because they're really passionate about martial arts and they want to hear other people who are passionate about martial arts. Yeah. We're, hmm, how do I ask this? When we think about how martial arts helps us grow and develop, become a different person, I, I think you would agree with, with me, a, a better version of ourselves. When we think about that, that growth, where is that most apparent? If you were to take someone who knew you really, really well up until, let's say, the, the day before you started training, or maybe maybe even you know a little bit after, but they, they hadn't seen you until you know maybe 10 or 15 years and you're training 20 years now, whatever's easiest to think about. And we reintroduced you. Mm. What would they notice is different about you? Well, uh, there are a couple, uh, there's a, an individual actually that train is trained with me now and we knew each other 30 plus years ago mm. under the same organization. And, um, and then another individual that trains with me as well. And uh, that uh, we, again, we knew each other back in the nineties and they've, it's funny that you you asked that they, they you know we've had this conversation over the past year separately they didn't even speak to each other they know each other very well but somehow that topic came up Andy you're not the same person that you were when we first when I first knew you what do you mean well you were kind of a hothead and <laughs> you didn't have too much of a filter and I still I still uh, have to work on my filter sometimes in the social <laughs> social circles. Um, but you would just say anything, you know, the etiquette, you know, you're, you're always getting in trouble with sensei <laughs> and, uh, um, but yeah, it was, it was more of, um, so much energy balled up, just like having a difficult time controlling that energy. And that's how they kind of described it. And, um, but you're a different person now, um, uh, whatever has happened to you, it must be the training it must be again, you know, being a, a, a family man and all these things put together that, that help change you because you are so, so different and, and so farther ahead than you were years ago. So um, that to me, um, it's nice to hear. I know I have a long way to go. And when I get there, I'll probably be under the ground. Um, but that it, that's nice to hear. And, you know, in my own kids too, I have three children. And I specifically, you know, one of the reasons I started a home dojo was to share my martial arts, my karate primarily to my, my kids. And so each one of them, you know, both of my boys, I started at age five and invited friends and family and their kids so they would have all other kids their age to train with. And my daughter, I started at age four, um, you know, and they would. Uh, over the years, you know, helped me grow as a person and as a teacher, because, you know, one of the things that, you know, if you're uh, an instructor in a commercial dojo and you teach a class and then you go home, very rarely do you know, you know, from your immediate uh, students, you know, they can't give you immediate feedback because maybe they're not family. But I had family and we would just walk right in the house and say, they would say, why did you say that? Why did you why were you focusing on me when you were correcting me? Everyone was looking at me. And so I would get those comments from my own kids. And I would say, you know what? I need to work on um, how I work with others in different ways so that I can get the same message across, but also be sensitive to 
um, each individual and how they receive that correction or criticism. So between my own friends over many, many years and my own family, um, having that feedback and being open to feedback, and sometimes it was painful to hear, um, I was able to grow uh, and continue to grow. Let's kind of jump into a alternate dimension time machine sort of thing. Awesome. Let's yeah. pretend you didn't find martial arts. Mm. And let's say today we're having a conversation. Obviously, it wouldn't be on a martial arts podcast, but we're sitting down talking and I'm I'm learning about your life. Obviously, you wouldn't have a, a home dojo. There, there are lots of, you know, kind of micro experiences, smaller things that we could check off and say these things wouldn't have happened. But what about it at, at a deeper, more fundamental level? You know, who would you be? What would you be doing if you hadn't kept training or, or found training to begin with? Well, I mean, I, mean, I grew up in a, in a an okay neighborhood, but there were there were some tough areas. Uh, and I had some friends that were, you know, they were involved in drug and drugs and alcohol, very, very young, uh, ages. Um, and, and I, I truly believe that if I did not start training and I didn't have, I mean, my parents were amazing. I can't say anything more, but they just worked all the time. Um, and it was hard for them to parent when they're working all the time. Um, and also raising six kids. So when I was able to start training with, uh, uh, with Master Saka Nakai, um, he basically was, um, you know, helping my parents bring me up and go on the right path. And I think that if I didn't have that, I would probably not be where I am at all today. I would, many of the friends I grew up with are unfortunately either in jail or, you know, uh, or not here anymore. Um, and I think my life would be totally different. Yeah, it's it's interesting when we consider that question because I think so many of us, what you were talking about, you know, that that high energy, that intensity as a youth, I, I fully identify with that. And, you know, I, I don't know if, if any of my past instructors are going to listen to this episode, but, you know, if they do, they're, they're nodding along right now saying, yeah, yeah, Jeremy, he's, he wasn't the only one. You were like this too. And, and so many of us, yes, so many of us, for so many of us, martial arts is almost this accidental intervention that Absolutely. whether it's, it's fate or, or, you know, higher power, how luck, whatever you believe. I'm so thankful. I, I suspect you are. And so many others are thankful that it happened at the time that it did, because who knows? That's right. Who knows where we would have gone? And everyone finds different, you know, there are other, um, of course, other people that sure. are not into martial arts. Um, they, they could be into music. They could be into writing. They could be into art. I think what's interesting about martial arts is that that camaraderie that you build, uh, you learn, learning certain values to help develop you as a human being. Um, that you don't really necessarily get the same thing when you're, studying how to play a guitar or a piano um, individually. So I, I think with that respect, that's, it's um, that worked for me. And, and other people, they, you know, um, probably didn't need such, a, a, uh, such a, an activity to put them on the right track because they may have already been there. Mm -hmm. I definitely needed it, that's for sure. <laughs> so my, my parents were grateful that I, I started training and I had an, uh, an outlet and I had an, an awesome teacher and an organization of supportive uh, friends and dojo mates to help me along as well. Have you ever had a student that reminds you of you as a, as a youth? My daughter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter is, uh, um, she's, she's got that Latin, Latin temper. Uh, so yeah, she, she uh, definitely, uh, my two sons are more like their mother, uh, very genteel, but you know, they could take care of themselves. Um, uh, but definitely my daughter, for sure. In seeing some of yourself in her, does that make it easier, harder, both in training her? Um, it, it, was, it was definitely more difficult um, because it was, uh, you know, it, it, when, you, it, when you're in that person's place and you say, Hey, I've been there before. I know what you're dealing with. They don't, I mean, you know, especially if it's your own child, they don't really get it. 
you know, they don't, they, they, they probably think that and she's probably thinking that it's just lip service. And, you know, I get that. I mean, I, I remember when my father used to talk to me when I used to get in trouble and, um, and he would probably, you know, say the same thing. I don't, you know, don't go on this path because this is going to happen. What have you, you know, I learned from my lessons, what have you. Um, so, so, you know, you, uh, I've kind of learned that, uh, or at least in the last couple of years that, um, all you can really do as a sensei, regardless if you're the father or, or not is, is, is really guide and, and, and be a good example, um, and be an open, open to them as well to help, you know, allow them to help you as well. Cause they, you know, I, I would say that, um, my daughters, uh, you know, and my, my two sons were a big, big help for my overall development over the years. Yeah. Um, and all you have, you know, basically just kind of leave it up to the universe to, to hopefully they find, you know, the right way and just kind of, you know, point the way and they can either choose that direction or not. It's up to them. Hmm. You know, my daughter's 18 now, so it's, you know, as, as a father, you can, you know, as parents, we had to make the transitions. Like we really can't, you know, tell her exactly what to do anymore. She needs to make her own choices just like we did, you know, went through with our boys. And I kind of try to apply that in the dojo setting. Like I, you know, for those who are not, you know, not blood, um, you know, you try to give them advice uh, as far as training advice, but it's, it's really up to them to take the ball. I get it. One of the subjects that comes up on this show is around the educational benefit, not just of training, but of teaching mm -hmm. and how being on the other side, so to speak, especially your early experiences as an instructor can be so transformational to your own training and understanding of the arts that you teach. Did you find that for you? Um, could you give me an example? I mean, I'm not sure. sure. Uh, let, let me, well, let me, it, I, I was it. trying to pull myself out of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll put myself right in the middle of it. Okay. I didn't learn. I have, I learned more in the two years I had my own martial arts school than any other two, probably five or 10 year period of time training. Oh yeah. yeah. It I, was so 100%. revolutionary to me. It was a combination of, you know what? Oh, this is what my instructors were trying to get me to do. Oh, this is what they meant. Or you, you, you run out of ways to explain a thing to somebody who's not getting it and you keep coming up with new ways. And one of them creates a light bulb moment. You go, <gasps> I have to go completely relearn these 17 things now with this new understanding. Um, absolutely. I, I, I think that uh, as a martial artist, me personally, I don't think I would be where I am today if it weren't for teaching because it puts you kind of, uh, it puts, it, it made me feel responsible. Like, okay, I have class Monday night and on, you know, or, you know, coming up on the weekend when I'm thinking in my mind, what I'm going to go over and, I really need to know my material. Andy, you need to know your material. If people, uh, if your students are going to ask you questions and um, you are kind of flimsy on your answer um, and you're not certain, then they're not going to have confidence in you. And actually, you're not going to have confidence in yourself. So having my own dojo uh, going, you know, 19 years now, uh, I learned very early on, um, back in uh, 2002, that I really needed to my immerse myself in a different way as opposed to bowing to my sensei before, because basically I was just following the whole time, not in the leadership position. And you'll learn that to be a good leader, you have to be a, you have to be a good follower, but you also have people that count on you. They're coming to your dojo. Because they're and they're bowing to you to say, hey, we're trusting you to teach us. We're trusting you to give us the right answers. And um, there's a there's a lot of um, to that where that put me on. It's like if they trust me, that means I need to do my homework. I want to know more about Okinawan martial arts history. I want to know how Okinawan karate was influenced by not only China, China but also by Japan and also my, uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, uh, si uh, Siamese fighting as well. I want to know all that. I want to know how Okinawan Karate, you know, you know what, what really is it all about? Was that, to me, today, I view Okinawan Karate as almost like the original MMA from years ago. And, and it gives me uh, uh, great, it's exciting to me to learn more about it 
And then not only learning more about Okinawan karate and its history, but also sharing that, sharing that with, 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 with the people I train with. And the more we understand it, me personally and, my, and, and the people that I train with, it gives more meaning to what we do. Um, and as a student, you, you really, you know, when I was on the other side of the coin, so to speak, you basically are bowing to person to, hey, just show me the way. Could you just go ahead and catch my fish for me and feed me? I'll just do the physical training to just show, you know, what have you. With my own people that I train with, I also try to encourage them to do their own research, to do their own homework, to be their own self-sensei, not to always rely on me. Um, uh, and, you know, and I always tell the people that, that I train with, who's your, who's your number one sensei? I, sometimes I'll ask that question. They're like, well, you. I'm like, no, it's you. When you go home, I can't be with you 24-7. You know, if you're the one who has to self-discipline yourself to train at home. You're the one who, if you want to know more about the history of Okinawan Karate, you can come to me, yes, but you can do your own research. Um, so I try to empower my students, and, um, and, and, and also for me, it, it's, it, it brings me joy when I see someone actually go to that level to have a deeper understanding and look at the different applications in Kata uh, on a, in a progressive way and go to the nth degree. Uh, instead of just showing up, doing the kata and kihon, not asking questions, going home and not really dissecting what they're doing. Um, so, and I encourage that from the, you know, from white belt all the way to black belt. Of course, when you're a Q rank very early on, you're just learning the basic things, but it doesn't mean you can't ask good questions. It doesn't mean you can't have good interactive discussions. Um, so I, I hope that answers your, does that answer your question? It does. It does. And, and now I've got a follow up for you. Awesome. When we when we talk about those good conversations, uh, you can probably imagine as, as the host of a martial arts podcast, I love good questions and conversation about martial arts, regardless of the subject and almost irregardless, yes, I think it's a word, of the setting. Is there a, a way that you as an instructor encourage uh, your especially earlier younger students to ask those questions uh yes i, I mean what what, I th- what do you do to help them feel more comfortable in asking those questions mm-hmm. so they can they can pull the value out of the answers well i mean it really it depends on the age too like the, you know the little sure. little ones I, and i actually don't teach little ones any longer it's you know teenager and above but when they're little it's very difficult um for them to ask questions, but you'd be surprised what they do ask. Um, I generally, my uh, general uh, approach, every class is when we do an exercise or a drill, uh, it could be a kata, it could be an application drill from the kata, what have you. I always ask after the ex, do you have any questions? There's no stupid questions here. Give it to me. Let's as a group. Let's let's talk about what's in your mind. What you, what your thoughts are. Do you have any concerns that something's not going to work or not work? There. This is a safe space. So there's there's that constant dis- discussion. Pretty much every class that I have with my members, so that there's no fear to ask those questions. There's no fear to look dumb. There's no fear to. Oh, I don't want to put Andy on the spot because I don't want him, I don't want the, him to feel like that I'm trying to make him look bad or you know, it's 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 but it it takes time of course it's building that trust. Um, a lot of the people that have, that have trained with me now have been training with me for many many years, so it's kind of built into their mindset. Um, and this this is uh you know one of the things that I I wanted uh, when, when we say um, martial arts tradition. This is the martial arts tradition that I want to pass on in my dojo that, you know, when you look at the definition of tradition, you know, one of the, the Marian, Marian definition says to something like uh, to pass on a pattern of thought. And I would say that what I encourage is this pattern of thought or behavior, that it's okay 
to ask questions, to dive deep, as long as you do it in a respectful way on both sides, not only from um, the, the student, but also from the teacher. Uh, and I you know, try to teach them to ask these questions in a respectful etiquette way, um, but really, you know, all, you know, everything is open for discussion. Um, so that's, I kind of just built that into our dojo culture. Uh, and I have been for many, many years. So it's, you know, um, so it's ingrained in that. And that's what I would have expected is that it's a cultural thing. Yes. I, I have a theory and, you know, given that this is part of your culture, I, I would imagine you would agree. And, and I don't know how that we test this theory, but I would imagine that if you have a culture where asking questions is encouraged and it leads to, it, it, it a leads to better understanding as well as more enjoyment, better skill, better retention. Yes. I, I think, I think when, when we value people's inquisitive nature, which is not always uh, accepted in martial that's, arts. That's quite correct. often it's you do it this way because this is what I'm telling you to do. And there's time and a place for that. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to suggest otherwise, you know, you, if you're in the middle of your black belt test, you probably don't want to raise your hand and say, but why do we do it like this? Like, that's, right. that's probably <laughs> definitely the, the exact worst time that you could do something like that. That's right. But I, I'd love for the listeners out there just to, to, to think about this point. You know, if you have a school, do you encourage, even facilitate understanding via questions? Because, you know, it doesn't matter what period of history you, you go to, you will see that the best academics have some element of question and answer as part of the educational process. And it's something that I think a lot of times in our modern setting, especially our modern martial arts educational setting that relies on tradition that we don't always encourage, that it's either considered to be extracurricular or go read this book, or sadly, we have instructors out there who teach what they teach without understanding what and why they teach. Yes. Yes. I, there's another approach that I, I do incorporate occasionally in our dojo. Years ago, I trained at a seminar, and it was a, a Koru old style of martial art, um, Jodo. I, and we still practice that. We practice that also in my, in my dojo as well, Shinomusu Jodo. Anyway, it was uh, about a six to seven hour seminar, and uh, the lead sensei said there will be no talking and no questions the whole day. Mm. And at the first, you, you know, you think that, well, that's terrible. How am I going to learn? But my sensei used to say this too, Master Masaru Sakakai and his family, uh, his son, uh, son Soshihan and uh, Sakakai and, and, and his wife, Dojicho Sakakai as well. You know, there are questions, yes, you can learn a lot from questions and that feedback back and forth, but we also want you to develop your Budo eye. Learn by watching, learn by feeling the technique learn by watching others move and how they move correctly or incorrectly. And there's something to be said to that, that occasionally I will have a class and say, okay, there's no discussion today. We're going to try this type of uh, training today. We're just going to learn by watching, learn by feeling, you know? Um, and if we're doing a drill, um, I'm going to do it. You know, if I feel that there's something that you can approve upon, I'll do it with you back to you so you see how I do it to you and you will feel the technique and feeling the technique. Sometimes it's the best teacher than actually just verbally transmitting the knowledge, but you have that physical transmission of knowledge that passes through, which is very difficult to get on a zoom call. Yeah. So there's there's pluses like you said at the very beginning of this podcast there's negatives and positives to both sides i would say that sometimes you know just watching just feeling the technique um just being a sponge is one met one excellent method as well but the maturity level of that buddha has to be there it's very very hard for a white belt to get that for someone who's just coming in the first day absolutely I, i'm i'm right there with you we all learn slightly differently. Absolutely. You know, some of us learn kinesthetically, you know, by doing, some of us learn visually, some 
listen by hearing some learn best by observing two people doing it, you know, and, and I think that in any kind of good educational environment and a martial arts school is an educational environment, you know, first and foremost, the diversity of those, uh, instructional techniques, I think is really important. And it sounds like you, you recognize that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can, I can see all kinds of benefit to shut up and just do it. Yep. And you're going to figure out part of it. Maybe not the whole thing, but you're going to figure out part of it. And you might be figuring out part of it that you wouldn't figure out if you were focused on, uh, when do I get next, get the opportunity to ask this question so I can understand this part. Exactly. Because you've only got so many brain cycles and you, you can't put them all everywhere that you, you're going to have to split them up. If you're worried about more than one thing at a time. That's right. Wow. If people want to, find you website social media email stuff like that where would they go um thanks jeremy i appreciate that i i i have a private dojo in delaware i'm actually my dojo is at at, at its capacity but i would refer anyone who's interested in our organization to um look up chintacon.com chintacon.com um down in jacksonville florida um the organization's called sabudakai and chintacon um, they are an amazing organization, uh, teach karate, they got a long history. They're actually going to be celebrating 60 years of, uh, martial arts teaching and training next year. Ma- amazing people. Um, also I have uh, sister dojo run by, uh, sensei, uh, Eric Kanto down in Culpeper, Virginia. Um, um, we are, um, kind of, uh, he trained with me years ago in the early 2000s. Uh, and a very accomplished martial arts in his own right. Amazing background in Culpeper, Virginia. He's uh, he's looking for some new students. He's a good good man, very talented individual, and an awesome teacher. I learned a great deal from him as well. So um, just want to you know, shout out to those two locations. Um, uh, and you know the the main my you know the main parent organization and the Iwa Dojo of Culpeper, uh, Virginia. Nice, nice. And of course, you know, we'll, we'll log that stuff at, at the show notes at the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anybody who's new and skipped the intro. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course. Of course. Well, thanks for being here. And this is your opportunity to, to kind of sum it up or parting words, you know, anything like that. Um, you know, what would you want to leave the audience with at the end of our conversation today? Um, and this might be a good topic for another podcast, but there's a, a gentleman that I discovered not too long ago. His name is, are you familiar with Alexander Bennett? I'm not. Alexander Bennett is a New Zealander. Uh, he comes from New Zealand and he uh, uh, is a, a professor at a university in Japan, but uh, he's a uh, kendo, uh, kendo teacher and practitioner. Um, and, uh, he's an amazing, um, scholar, uh, about the history of Budo. And I want to leave this quote, uh, from Alexander Bennett, um, um, here on this podcast, which I thought was really just hit me deep. Uh, and I think it applies to not only Japanese Budo, but other martial arts traditions. Uh, this is his, uh, quote, Japanese Budo is hardwired into saying, that tradition is the be all and end all and that it must stay as it is because it is the way it has always been. But actually this goes against traditional Budo because Budo has always been about evolution and change. I told you, I told you it was a great conversation. I told you we were all over the place with some really good stuff. I, I want to thank Andy for coming on the show. Thanks for just just being such a great guest. I I had a lot of fun and I hope you, the listener also had a lot of fun. So a few housekeeping notes, keep these things in mind. You want to go deeper? Maybe you missed a a, a link or a a mention on the episode somewhere or you're driving, you don't want to write things down. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Go to episode 624 and you can find all the stuff that we talked about. If you want to support us, and I hope that you do, I'm going to give you three things that you could do. You could support our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You could tell somebody about the show. Say, hey, are you familiar with martial arts radio? No? 
well, here's my favorite episode. Give them your favorite episode. Don't just send them to the website. Send them your favorite episode and tell them why you love it. Okay. And then here's the third thing. Go to whistlekickprograms.com and grab the speed training program. Check it out. It's not that much time commitment. It is based on the latest scientific principles and it works. It really does. So check that out over there. If you have an idea for the show, if you have some feedback, a guest, topic suggestion, something like that, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Remember, you can follow us on social media. We're all over the place at Whistlekick. And that's what we've got for you today. Got another episode for you coming soon. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>